Hey kid, you, get, come over here. Closer. Closer. Closer, just too close, too close. Okay. You wanna drink something illegal? Hey there, hi there, ho there, and how you doing? Welcome to Mike's Hard Reviews. My name is Mike, I am one of the bartenders at the Hilton Gardens Inn, bar, and restaurant, and today we are gonna be talking about uh, breaking the law. Well, kind of. I mean, thank goodness liquor isn't legal anymore. It's really only a name that we're breaking any rules. We're going to be talking about a drink called the Forbidden Sour, which is essentially a variation on a standard bourbon whiskey sour with the addition, namely, of pomegranate as a key flavoring agent uh, in the mix. So the Forbidden Sour was invented by a New York bartender by the name of Eben Freeman, who is also credited with the Kumquat Caipirinha, which if I had a place to get cachaça, I would definitely try myself. Essentially, it's kind of designed to be a super approachable version of a bourbon whiskey sour, which is already a pretty approachable drink when you think about it, actually. I guess the overall goal with this drink was to create a whiskey sour that people could enjoy if they weren't super fond fans of bourbon or super fond fans of high-proof cocktails, which Really, this presents a pretty significant solution to both of those problems. Forbidden Sour gets its name from the idea that uh, in the story of Genesis with the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, the forbidden fruit that they both partake in is actually not a apple, it's a pomegranate, which leads to the key flavoring in the drink and therefore the term forbidden in its name. I'm not a religious man and I was not aware of that, uh, that distinction, that there was a whole discussion about whether or not it was an apple or something else. Uh, my thought is, who cares? The symbolism is still there, you know? Whatever. I digress. All that's really important to note from that element of this drink, this whole kind of backstory overarching thing, is that it results in the inclusion of pomegranate as a key flavor in the sour, and that is accomplished with a liqueur known as Pama. I have a bottle of Pama here. Uh, it's actually been super popular in my house, if you can't tell based on how low the wash line is in this bottle. And essentially this is a pomegranate liqueur that has been made with vodka and, in their words, a touch of tequila. That's a really bad way to market what's in your liqueur. <laughs> like a touch of tequila doesn't really state anything about how strong that flavor is, what that does for the flavor. And I mean, I think I can detect it even still, like drinking this as just like a, a neat spirit. It, it doesn't help me imagine what kind of consistency I can get out of this bottle. Uh, by just saying a touch of tequila. Despite that though, uh, I will say this is probably, um, despite the weird nomenclature on the front, is actually probably one of the most delicious, like straight sipping liqueurs I've ever seen in my entire life. And that's saying something because I don't really sip neat liqueurs. I usually would sip neat liquor, like whiskey or gin, but this is actually something I could see people enjoying on its own, like over the rocks, actually. Really, more than anything, what this, what's in this bottle is uh, sweet and tart, um, almost in a candy-like way. Not like in a super, like, brazen, like, harsh candy way, but like in a sort of pleasant, somewhat light, uh, kind of rolling, um, just full-bodied presence in the mouth. At the same time, that touch of tequila thing kind of adds this like mitigating um, vegetal note you get sometimes in, uh, in in tequilas, which I think is a really important thing because otherwise, what's in this bottle right here would be supremely, overly, ridiculously sweet. Despite this being a liqueur with like, really sweet flavors built into it, this is actually avoiding, kind of by a hair almost, um, maybe thanks to that tequila, um, being medicinal, um, like tasting like medicine. This is an impressive spirit right here, is essentially what I'm getting at. It's also kind of one of a kind. I haven't, there are other pomegranate avail uh, liqueurs available. Um, this is what, this pama is specifically what this recipe calls for. So I'm going to use it today, but I, under no circumstances would say you could swap this out with a different pomegranate liqueur and experience the same thing. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more later when we start talking about how to make this drink and making one ourselves, but as of right now, I would tentatively, I would, I would tentatively say don't replace this with anything just to use Pama. It's cheap and generally available, um, at least at real like liquor and wine spirit shops kind of thing. So now that we've had a quick discussion about what exactly Pama is and what role it's going to play in the drink, we're going to talk about and actually make 
uh, a forbidden sour. So first we're gonna need a shaker, which I have conveniently forgotten. So like I said, you're gonna need a shaker. Uh, I personally prefer a three-piece Boston. Um, the difference between this and other shakers uh, is that this is a three-piece that essentially uses a lid instead of two cups and has a built-in um, multi-hole strainer here at the top. As long as you got something to put it all together, it really doesn't quite matter, I don't think. Like I said, we're gonna need our pama. This is gonna be a really key ingredient in establishing the flavor in a forbidden sour, but we're also going to need a bourbon whiskey, and I would recommend specifically staying with a bourbon. I previously tried to make this drink off camera for myself twice. Uh, once I used Evan Williams uh, Bottled and Bond uh, bourbon whiskey, and then I also used Rittenhouse Bottled and Bond Rye Whiskey. I think it might actually be better to go for a bourbon that isn't super high in proof, so that this is still an approachable drink, but at the same time to go for a bourbon that is very notably carrying those key bourbon flavors. So you're gonna be looking for things like cherry and honey and specifically oak, and I actually think you wanna go for something that has a good amount of bitterness to it. Bourbon being an aged spirit from wood barrels carries wood tannins, which are oftentimes bitter, and the more bitter they are, the more wood oils are in there, that whole thing. I can go on about bourbon for forever. The point is that, that those wood tannins make the drink bitter, and in the presence of the palma and the simple syrup that's gonna go into this drink along with the lemon juice, some bitterness is gonna be good to hold up the flavor of that bourbon against the palma. Uh, I'll talk about those two instances when I previously made this drink uh, after we get this one made because there was some kind of weird stuff happening and I think that can go into a discussion about why palma might not be the best spirit on the face of the planet for mixing. For today though, I am going to go for a different variety of Evan Williams, actually. This is Evan Williams 1783 small batch, which uh, legally speaking means nothing but this is a 90 proof uh, bourbon whiskey that carries notes similar to um, bullet bourbon. And then on top of that, I would say kind of like uh, Woodford Reserve, but way, way more narrow, way less developed. And probably, you know, it's a small batch on the front here, probably aged in substantially smaller barrels than uh, their normal whiskey varieties. Um, which would mean that the bitterness is going to come out a little stronger, you're going to get less of a full flavored note. It's bourbon, but it's like the only things in bourbon that you expect to be there are there and they're present and they're strong. And that's why I want to use this one, because I think it'll hold up well against the sweetness in the pomo. You're also going to need a uh, lemon juice of your choosing and uh, some simple syrup. The simple syrup doesn't matter, you can make it yourself if you want. I always just buy mine pre-made because I find that easier and Frankly, it's the same thing. It's not really gonna make any significant difference. Um, the thing that might be argued here is that you might wanna use fresh lemon juice. Um, I'm using real lemon lemon juice, which is 100% lemon juice that's just been preserved with sulfites. So it has a flavor profile kind of similar to cheaper wines, but not in a way that interferes with the lemon flavor. I think this is fine. A lot of people are complain and say that you should really use freshly squeezed you know, lemon or lime juice. I don't tend to keep those citruses on hand like fresh, um, and this is, a more cost-effective, simple, easy way to get lemon juice into a drink, so... Technical error? Absolutely. Also perfectly fine for our purposes today? Absolutely. So we're gonna start combining this into our shaker here. I have a table here in front of me, which um, I wish you could see. We're gonna start by adding uh, one ounce of our pama. I'm gonna do this in kind of the wrong order. It's supposed to go from smallest to largest, but what does it really matter? Um, um, that pomegranate flavor is really unique, and it stands out in a way that's um, really important here. Um, it kind of, it's the whole reason the drink works cohesively in the first place. Um, but that kind of vegetal slight tequila note means that as a neat spirit, this carries more character than you would expect. And in com combination with a bourbon, what I think you would normally expect, depending on what bourbon you're looking for, is for that to play on the flavors in the bourbon and produce a, at least generally more pleasant um, more pleasant flavor profile, something that adds complexity to the drink. We're gonna go for the bourbon next. Uh, you're gonna need an ounce of this as well, um, which I think is kind of odd, actually. Um, I was thinking about that when I first read about this recipe. The palma and the bourbon appear in um, equal quantities, and normally when you're flavoring a main spirit with something else, you're using less than an ounce, or at the very least, less than your main spirit. You would think, oh, two ounces of bourbon, or maybe an ounce and a half of bourbon, to half an ounce of palma and then your simple syrup and lemon juice, which is actually a proportion I'm gonna talk about later because I didn't end up using it for something else. You know, in general, um, 
it's just an interesting choice, I find. I find that to be a very, very interesting choice. So we're gonna add that one ounce of bourbon to that cup, and next up we're gonna do the lemon juice, because I just bought this simple syrup and I have to open it, and I'd rather just keep moving forward. So it's only half an ounce of lemon juice in this drink, uh, which is a pretty standard quantity for a sour. In the way that sugar does, it enhances some of the spicy wood tannin flavors in the bourbon, which I think is actually quite nice. The one thing you're gonna see here that's missing from other, um, from other uh, whiskey sours, which isn't super common, um, but does happen quite a bit, is an egg white. Um, which I think it's kind of an interesting choice because um, egg white elevates the mouthfeel and texture and in some ways the flavor of um, a whiskey sour. So in the presence of the palma, you'd think it'd be a nice way to make it almost sorbet-like. What you're gonna notice is that all these components are going to make a very sweet beverage, which is the reason why this is so um, easily approachable, which is probably the intention. In fact, I appreciate there being a, a sweeter way to introduce people to the concept of um, high ethanol and high ABV sipping drinks. Um, I don't think this is the best way to do it though, and I'll tell you why in a sec. So next we need to shake this. Uh, I need to go get some ice. I usually use Dave Arnold's method of a single large ice cube and a secondary large ice cube cracked. The first one stays whole. Um, that adds agitation and also chilling and dilution in pretty equal amounts. And I generally consistently rely on that because it works. Um, with this drink though, I'd actually recommend shaking it over a lot of smaller ice cubes or two cracked large ice cubes instead of having one large one. The only thing you really have to dissolve into the rest of it, the rest of the liquid in this drink, is the simple syrup, which you could do just fine with smaller ice. And on top of that, I think this, uh, this drink gains benefit from there being a good amount of dilution in the liquor. It'll bring out the flavors in the bourbon, which will help it stand up better. It'll cool down the sweetness of the palma at the same time and kind of help draw everything together in one glass. So I've got some large ice cubes here, and I've also got a single, I think it's a double rocks glass actually, with um, a large uh, ice cube in it, just for chilling purposes later. I would definitely serve this drink on the rocks because it'll help keep it cool, which is definitely how it's intended to be served. And I try to crack these, so they haven't tempered too badly. I'm gonna crack that one in half, and then I'm gonna go for a bit more of a shatter on one of these. In general, I think um, you don't really have to worry too much about how much you shake this. I think it's more important to just focus on the fact that it gets shaken a decent amount just to incorporate some dilution into the drink. Good cap off our shaker and we're just gonna give it a quick shake. You're gonna take your glass and you're going to pour this over. Throw that in there. The thing if you're using a three-piece Boston shaker like I am is the ice is gonna catch on that filter and you're gonna get um, a decent amount of liquid being held back by it. So be sure to give it a shake when you're pouring it in so that everything comes out. So here's our drink. Um, I probably could have double strained this because some of that ice did get kind of pulverized in there. But you can see it's this kind of light pink-ish color. It's, it definitely looks kind of like bourbon with a, a kind of pink reddish color added to it. Um, as far as garnishes go, I'm gonna leave this one ungarnished. I don't think it makes a huge difference, but uh, an orange wheel or a lemon wheel tucked into the glass next to the ice is the way I would go. Let's give this a quick taste then and see how this came out. You know, better than I remembered. <laughs> when I first made this drink, I mentioned that I made it with Evan Williams bottled in Bond. And there's something weird about that whiskey, or maybe it's maybe it's not the whiskey, maybe it's the bottle I have, or the glass I used, or something. The last thing I made with it, I, I believe, was the Forbidden Sour, and for some reason, I got this really prominent buttery flavor. That is absent here. There is no, like, weird butteriness to this drink in this glass. Um, and in fact, I actually think this is a much better drink than the first one that I made. Immediately, you get candy sweetness, like sugar sweetness on the front. And I think that might be because of the simple being in there in such a great quantity. But what comes in immediately after that is the flavor of that pomegranate in the palma. It kind of comes in, sweeps in, and it hits you. It's almost citrus-like. I think it's working with that lemon juice to produce what is actually kind of close to um, a lime flavor in a way. I think there's a kind of mitigating 
sweetness and a certain flavor tonality to what is in the Pama that brings out this lime-like flavor in what would otherwise be just bright, flat lemon. And not to say lemon's a flat flavor necessarily, but um, it, it's not what you would expect. It's actually quite pleasant. The bourbon, the bourbon kind of disappears a little bit. And I think that might be the intention, because again, you want this to be approachable, and bourbon's probably not the most approachable spirit. If I was really going for something super approachable, and I was going to use Palma, I'd probably just do a variation on a margarita, or not a margarita, a um, martini, where you swap, you use gin, which is light, and but has decent flavors in it, and is, you know, reasonably approachable. Um, swap out any vermouth in there for Palma, um, and then add, um, a slightly greater amount of like lime juice to it rather than just an expression like maybe like a quarter to a half an ounce of lime juice um, or lemon juice just to give it some sweetness. This kind of wastes the bourbon in a way. I mean if you know what to look for if you're looking for bourbon it's definitely there. It, it doesn't disappear completely but I don't think it's accentuated here. And this is kind of the problem that um, I wanted to discuss because this happened with the Rittenhouse rye too. If you've ever had Rittenhouse rye whiskey it's a pretty predominant flavor. It's rye. Rye whiskey is a lot stronger in its palate and its tonalities than bourbon is, than corn whiskey is, than weeded bourbons are. There's a lot to consider there. Even then, in the presence of the palma, the flavors in the rye, just the spices and the heavy flavors and you know the oiliness were kind of obliterated and actually didn't taste all that great. I think that the problem with using palma as a primary flavoring agent here is that it kind of muddles down a lot of really strong flavors. It's got so much sweetness packed in there that there's really nothing else it can do aside from cut down on really harsh flavors and tones. A, a different proportion here would be great because I think an approachable drink should be sweet and pleasant and not mess with your, you know, not make you crinkle your nose or, you know, curl your toes. I, I think it should be something that people can unanimously agree is easy to drink. And in, in this configuration, that's happening, but it's it's not allowing the bourbon to maintain its complexity, which is kind of how I'd want that. Because in an approachable drink, you want to be able to show somebody, hey, this is what this spirit tastes like. We've sweetened it up with this other flavor to make a cocktail out of it. What do you think? And then you can expand on that person's, you know, palette in terms of whatever spirit you're using. If anything, if I were to change this recipe up, I would just drop down the proportion of Palma from one ounce to half an ounce, up the bourbon to an ounce and a half and keep everything else the same. Um, maybe add an egg white actually at that point. I think that might be interesting. Kind of dealer's choice there, but in general, not a bad drink, but feels kind of uh, unelevated, I guess is the word I'm looking for here. Like I'm expecting I guess I might be expecting a bit much from a drink that's supposed to be very simple and approachable, but at the same time, there's there's potential here to use a really cool ingredient to make something that stands out more than more than anyone else would expect. In general, though, yeah, not not a bad drink, just kind of not what I would expect. So in general, the Forbidden Sour is not a bad drink per se, but it's one that I think lacks evolution and is a little too approachable for my taste. I think that there's something that could be done here to give a more experiential nature to the drink. And I actually kind of riffed a little bit the other day and got a, um, a secondary variant of this drink in a way um, that I think is a bit more, not only palatable in a lot of ways, but um, is, is more complex, more interesting, and uses ingredients that I think fit that forbidden, uh, forbidden fruit theme a little bit better. Before I dive into my variation though, uh, I do want to say, can you make a forbidden sour without Palma? Absolutely not. No, I don't think so. Um, another pomegranate liqueur? Probably. But if you didn't want to buy another bottle, if you wanted to use something like say grenadine, which is a syrup that's flavored predominantly with pomegranate, you're not going to get the same results. Um, the ethanol in the bourbon is going to be really shiny and upfront and in your face and the sweetness is gonna kind of come through second, and it, it all just kind of sits there as one sugar note. The, the actual liqueur-like nature of Palma does change up the way the flavors are presented, and that does mean that it is kind of a requirement, unfortunately, uh, if you're going to, excuse me, if you're going to make a forbidden sour. That said though, uh, there is another way to go about this, and I thought about it thematically, and almost immediately my, my mind jumped to, well, we've got a drink that has uh, pomegranate in it. 
I mentioned earlier that that was one theory for what the forbidden fruit was. What about the apple? How about we make a drink that has apple in it? And from my own personal viewings of how to drink, I know of apple, uh, Laird's Apple Jack. So Laird's Apple Jack is an apple brandy that is, um, I haven't read up on it really what the history behind it is, but it's a 100% apple brandy, um, registering at 43% alcohol by volume, which is actually pretty good considering that we don't want something that's too proofy, um, lest it kind of throw off the flavor balance in the drink. And what I think this gives us is a really interesting flavor to work with. Brandies are oak aged, uh, and this is a brandy made from apples. So you're going to get those apple flavors in the brandy in combination with those notes you get from barrel aging. So that means um, oak, vanilla, probably some honey, maybe some cherry, depending on the wood blend, but that's generally something that comes from your mash bill rather than, um, or what the liquor is made of rather, than the aging process. All that being said, we are going to make a cocktail with this that I call the Garden of Eden. And it's gonna be a little bit more complex than, in to make and in flavor, I think, than uh, a forbidden sour, but that extra effort goes a long way. I'm gonna go ahead and clean out my shaker because I forgot to do that because I'm bad at producing my own show. So what you're gonna need for this drink is to start off um, the Laird's Applejack, we're gonna start there. Um, so we're gonna need an ounce and a half of this, which is slightly more uh, than the amount of whiskey, the main spirit in the original drink. And I'm doing this so that the flavors in the Laird's Applejack are more pronounced than uh, the flavors in the whiskey were in the Forbidden Sour. I wanna bring out some of those apple flavors, those, uh, those brandy notes. I want that to be something present in the drink because that's where most of our evolution is going to come from. Uh, because there really isn't any, there's no aging diploma. There's no, it's just, you make it and then you put it in the glass bottle and you're done. Um, so you're not gonna get many, you know, flavors appearing in your mouth as your taste buds and your brain process that flavor. It's kind of one note. Uh, and this, as a spirit, increasing that volume of it, um, in addition to using a spirit that is aged, will give us that evolution back. Next, we're going to jump to a half an ounce of Palma pomegranate liqueur, half the original amount that was used in the Forbidden Sour. I'm cutting it back because there's enough sweetness coming in from other things in here, and I actually don't want there to be a ton of sweetness. I want there to be a bit more of a dry flavor going on here with sweet notes in it to kind of expand across the palate, cause changes, make you experience the drink more than just drink it. I'm gonna go off the cuff here actually and add something that wasn't here in my original recipe. This is Midori. This is a melon liqueur from Japan. It tastes delicious, and what I noticed um, really, the reason why I'm doing this is because I wanted to get some green in the drink. Normally this comes out kind of like a uh, like a light brown color, like um, like uh, sort of how cider would look. Um, I want to change that a bit. Uh, so I'm gonna go for about a quarter ounce to a th uh, one third ounce of Midori in there to give it a green color and then expand upon the apple flavor a bit. I think uh, melon's a good compliment for that flavor, and it might bring out some of those apple notes a little bit more. I don't know though. Next up, we're gonna do the half ounce of simple syrup. I always do this at least second to last so that I can put something else in my uh, jigger and then uh, rinse it out so that we get the full amount of simple syrup in there. Um, and then last, we're gonna switch over from lime juice, sorry, from lemon juice to lime juice. We're gonna use lime juice instead. Again, real lime juice, brand-wise. Completely fine and functional for what we're using here. I'm gonna throw a half ounce of that into the drink. We could call it there. We could call it there. However, I don't think we should. <laughs> There's an experiential thing I've mentioned here already, uh, and that is adding an egg white to your drink. Now, if you wanna give this a shot, um, you just gotta be comfortable with the fact that there is some raw egg technically in your drink, but egg whites are generally less uh, dangerous to eat because there's less protein in there. Um, so the chance of getting salmonella from an egg white is substantially smaller. And also we're emulsifying it in the shaker with that lime juice. Um, we're kind of unfolding those proteins and making them inert. So they're safe to drink um, as long as you are comfortable with the idea of drinking it. Um, what this does is add kind of a creamy velvety flavor to the drink, the mouthfeel changes up a little bit and it's gonna give us a nice foamy head in the top of our glass that'll look really nice. Now the trick is you don't wanna get any egg white, or eggs, rather egg yolk uh, into the drink at all if you can help it. Uh, because that's not only going to make the drink potentially dangerous to ingest, but also ruin the chance of getting any proper frothing. 
I gotta throw this egg away before it gets all over my floor. So now that we have the egg white in there, what we actually have to do is add another step, technically. You can shake an egg white over ice, and I made the mistake here actually of putting ice in the shaker uh, off camera and then putting the egg white in there on top of that. Technically speaking, you're gonna to wanna to dry shake this, um, which means there's no ice in it, it's just the liquor and the syru uh, citrus and the syrup with the egg white. You shake that, it emulsifies it, makes it froth up. That's gonna be a lot harder to do with this ice. So we're gonna to have to shake this a lot more, which is gonna get us more dilution, which actually might not be a bad thing. Um, but in general, you're gonna to wanna to add the step of shaking dry and then cracking it open slowly because the process of dry shaking will cause the contents in the shaker to expand and could potentially blow a cap off. So you wanna open that slowly, release that pressure, then add ice and shake it chill. I'm gonna see how this comes out. Uh, I might have to do this again <laughs> uh, real quick off camera if uh, this doesn't froth up right and is just gross. So we'll see how this goes. Ooh, it's cold. Oh yeah, I got that just fine. I think because I used cracked ice, it was just agitating enough to get that to work. I'm gonna get a glass and some ice and pour that in there. So I've got in the double rocks glass here with a piece of ice in there. And we're just gonna go ahead and crack open our shaker and pour that in. What you are definitely gonna be seeing though is a significantly cloudier spirit. And what that is, is that egg white having been emulsified into the liquor will steadily form, come up to this top and form a gradient and then form a foamy head uh, at the very top there. I didn't garnish the last drink, so this is kind of a little bit unfair. Um, because the garnish does occasionally add some kind of component to this, but this drink, as I have built, it does call for a garnish uh, in the form of a spritz of cinnamon. Uh, you know, not, not like a ton, you don't want like a lot of cinnamon on top of this. Just a little bit to get the aroma going. Really, it's up to you how much you want to do there. I think it, it depends on how much you like the idea of uh, cinnamon as a, you know, uh, accoutrement to apple. And then additionally, uh, you want to do about a quarter's worth of how much cinnamon you put uh, in the form of nutmeg, also on top of that foamy head. So what that does is basically give this a kind of spiced component, which I think with the pomegranate and the apple in the Applejack is a super nice thing. I think it just tastes really nice. It gives it this really experiential kind of thing. Let's give this a quick taste because my camera's about to die. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's really good. Oh man. Okay, so immediately what you're getting is this kind of sweet brandy nut. This, this kind of like woody brandy note that still has some sweetness to it. And you're getting that along with that cinnamon, that nutmeg and that creaminess that's coming through very bit, very, very prominently on the front. At the same time, with that brandy note, that like slight amount of barrel bitterness is in there. At the same time, both the Midori and the Palma are hidden there. Uh, they're, that flavor's landing there. I think the Midori you could actually skip. It's kind of muting the Palma note actually. But what you're getting immediately after that is like this fresh berry and apple note that's really light, really pleasant, really tasty. It's it, it's like drinking uh, like a berry apple cider almost. Yeah, really strong notes of vanilla too. Like it's, I, I think of the egg, I think the egg white and the creaminess of that is kind of bringing that experience out of that brandy. And then after that, you get this almost kind of tart apple note that I think tastes Absolutely amazing. I love this drink very much. A friend of mine yesterday also uh, also tried it. She's not a big um, proofy drink person. This is a distinctly proofier drink. High proof, that is high ABV, than um, if you're been sour. And, he, and she was like, yeah, I like that a lot. The way the flavors in here are balanced, even though you can somewhat taste that, uh, that, that ethanol, that alcohol, it's really not jumping out at you like it is with the Forbidden Sour. They're, they're, that's not even to say that the Forbidden Sour is throwing it out at you like crazy either. This though is kind of masquerading as a non-alcoholic drink. It's a little dangerous actually. It tastes really, really good and uh, frankly, better than a Forbidden Sour. <laughs> now, a couple of ways I think you can improve this. First of all, a proper garnish. I obviously didn't go that way. I, I went just for um, cinnamon and uh, nutmeg, which actually the first time I made this, I shook into the drink, which is actually probably a better idea. Shaking them into the drink gives it like this throughout a actual flavor of it, not just like the, an experiential note in the drink. And I th like just at the top of the drink when you first take your sip, I think that's a more effective way to do it. I would add a sprinkle of 
cinnamon, and then a quarter amount of your sprinkle of cinnamon, cinnamon and nutmeg to the shaker, then shake it, and then uh, garnish it with something else. Likening this to the same friend who I was speaking about yesterday, earlier, the one who's not in super into high-proof drinks, um, she suggested a sprig of mint on the front, uh, along with some apples, and I suggested maybe some brandy cherries, but that might be kind of a lot thrown there at one time. Um, the idea being that you want this to be, oh, you know, it's the Garden of Eden, you want a garnish that is bright, you know, green and bright and leafy and something you makes the drink feel more like a garden, kind of. Um, I think that is definitely a great way to go with that. Um, and thank you to her for that suggestion, because if I ever have mint on hand, I will absolutely do that. Uh, as, a, as a garnish from here on out. But yeah, so um, there you have it. That was the Forbidden Sour and then my own personal variation on the idea of that drink with the Garden of Eden. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this little dip into mixology and cocktail making, a little bit of history about a specific kind of cocktail. Uh, Eben Freeman, if you have a Twitter, uh, you can find me on there at uh, Mike Hard Reviews or Mike's Hard Review on Twitter. It'll be a link in the description down below. I'm not super active on there because I have only just started posting. So eventually uh, I will I will be able to talk more <laughs> on there and interact with you guys. If even Freeman has a Twitter he's active on, uh, everybody tweet this at him. I would love to get his uh, personal idea of how, uh, how this drink is in his opinion and what it needs. Uh, so otherwise, um, thank you guys so much for watching, and hopefully you guys enjoyed this. If you did, click that subscribe button down below and click the notification bell to find out when I am going to be posting more frequently. I'm going to make this a every Saturday thing, hopefully. Um, so this video is going up at noon EST uh, on Saturday, what is it, June 26th, 2021. Hopefully I can make this an every Saturday thing following that, with occasional bonus episodes here and there, because. There's a lot that I want to talk about, there's a lot to talk about, and as a matter of fact, I've already got my next video lined up to shoot after this. Thank you guys so much for watching, I hope you guys enjoyed, and uh, hopefully I will see you around. If you want to come visit me, you can come check me out again at the Hilton Gardens Inn Hotel in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, stay tipsy.